Let's begin with prayer. God of compassion and might, we pray for your presence among us and in us and through us this morning, that we may hear your word and scripture for our lives and find the courage to make your purposes our own. And now may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O oh Lord, my rock and our redeemer. Amen. Putting God at the center of our lives, instead of placing ourselves there, is the essence and goal of Christian living, and perhaps the challenge of our day. This morning, as we discuss Luke's gospel message from Jesus, the directive to pray always and not to lose heart, it will be helpful to remember that making Christ the center of all things is the essential first step to embarking on a healthy prayer life, or any prayer life. From a Christ-centered life, we receive back the generous blessings of gratitude, abundance, and peace of mind. Christ at the center can solve the world of ills. Even, I might point out, on this Stewardship Sunday, our illness about money. Recently, I was reading the true story of a young minister in Connecticut who left seminary so indebted with student loans, overwhelmed by childcare costs, and frustrated by an inadequate income that she swore she would never tithe, never be able to tithe to the church. She was caught in a cycle of cash shortages until one day when she saw an extraordinary vision and everything changed. Driving home one summer afternoon, late from a meeting, late to get her child from daycare, too late to avoid a fine for late pickup and too late to avoid the rush hour traffic, she found herself stuck in a standstill traffic jam on a highway just outside of Hartford, Connecticut. Feeling stressed out and overwhelmed by a bad day gone worse, she took a deep breath and began to pray for relief, first and foremost for a way out of her money problems. And suddenly, the view out the window of her stuck-in-traffic car completely changed. The city of Hartford went from urban gray to a golden, gleaming glow. It was as if Hartford had been transformed into the city on the hill. Although the Capitol building there does have a golden dome, every building seemed to be lit up in gold, and the sky somehow melded with the buildings in a heavenly embrace. And then, just as suddenly, the veneer disappeared, and the city of Hartford looked like its old small city self again. The cash-strapped young minister closed her eyes tight and opened them again. Gleaming city, then gone. Heavenly city, then Hartford again. She said she did this several times until the traffic abated and she had to drive forward. And stunned, she prayed again. Traffic slowed and then stopped, allowing her to close her eyes completely. And this time, she saw three images. The first image was of her credit cards being cut up by a giant pair of scissors. The second was a gift package all wrapped up in a bow. And the third was the figure 10% that appeared in blazing light. Then the traffic began to move, her eyes opened, and she was on her way. When she arrived home, she told her husband about her vision and announced she would be cutting up their credit cards and begin tithing their income to the church. That's crazy, he said. How will we afford it? We will be getting a big gift, she advised, a financial windfall, she promised, and proceeded to cut up her credit cards, and they made their pledge to the church. Days passed, then weeks and although they were able to cut back their spending considerably without credit card access, the big gift never came. 
Naively and desperately, she prayed for that gift until it was clear that she had misread that part of her vision. So the minister and her husband called a financial planner instead and started to organize a plan that would slowly get them to the place they wanted to be, debt-free and able to tithe on an after-tax basis at first, the church. And it worked. It was years later when she understood that the long-hoped-for gift part of her vision had been realized without her even knowing it. As she and her husband struggled together to be disciplined in their saving and spending, they did, in fact, receive many gifts. Their parents helped out with summer camp fees and music lessons for the kids. Their family was blessed with good health, and friends would come to the rescue when times were lean. Most importantly, she remarked, was that she finally recognized that the visionary gift she had seen all wrapped up with a bow was in fact the gift of Christ in her life, in whom her debt had been repaid long ago. God's intervention and a new understanding of the abundance already around her helped her discover the joy of giving. She writes, I now stand in a long line of followers of Jesus who say things about money that make no sense, at least not as the world calculates things. But what started making sense for her was God's gift of grace and mercy, free of charge, and an outlook on life characterized by abundant grace, a sense that she already had enough, enough for her family to live on, and even enough to share with her church. Truth be told, not too many people tithe these days, whereas giving 10% of your income to the church used to be the norm. National statistics now show a downward trend of giving to churches everywhere, along with declining membership overall. Presbyterians give, on a national average, about 2 to 3% of their family income to the church. The decline in giving is troubling, but it is likely that many of us are giving 10% of our incomes away overall, but to other charities in addition to the church. There are so many competing causes and interests we pursue that not all our money stays here. And for larger churches, there tend to be more free riders and a greater dependence on a smaller number of larger donors. But we, like every church, need all our participants to help fund the programs and services enjoyed here. For Presbyterians, congregants are the only source of funding that we have. Today marks the day when our church begins its stewardship season. Our stewardship commission is asking each of you to do your part by making a pledge, a promise today to pay dollars in 2017 to the First Presbyterian Church of Metuchen to keep it up and running. Making a pledge now helps the Finance Commission budget this autumn for the year ahead. It's stewardship season. You may hear similar calls from your favorite charities around town, but remember that your church is unique. Your dollars are needed here because we offer two things that none of the others do not NPR or the YMCA or the American Red Cross. What we offer brings us back to God at our center, the center of our lives and the center of our world. What's unique about the charity offerings of church is two things, ministry and mission in the name of Jesus Christ. No one but the church community is doing the work that connects our sacred center to the here and now. No one else is discerning the needs of the community and meeting those needs with the love of God through the intervention of each one of you. And at the First Presbyterian Church of Metuchen, our church is not dying or declining. It's growing. We have more new members today, more baptisms every month, more students in Sunday school and confirmation class, more commissions at work and ministries unfolding, more weddings to come, more choir members to sing, and more love from God every day. 
So when we think about giving financially to the church, we can think about the abundances in our lives and the way God has blessed us to be a blessing in the world, the church world that we have chosen to be our own. Now it is from this place of blessing and abundance, the ironic pairing of needing and giving away, and the timeless truth of always receiving back more than we ever give, that we discover parallels to the paradox of prayer revealed in our scripture lesson this morning. Luke offers two parables from Jesus on the importance of praying always and the encouragement not to lose heart. We hear only one of the parables this morning, but it is followed immediately by a second. As is so often the case with Luke, Christ's teachings are given in pairs. A story about a man and a parallel story about a woman. Today's story is about a widow who has not been treated fairly and an unjust judge who turns away from his typically bad behavior to doing the right thing by her because she was persistent in her petitioning. The parable that follows it, that Luke chooses as its pair, is about a sinner who confesses his wrongs and prays to God for mercy. The sinner receives God's grace and forgiveness, just as the good widow received her justice from an unjust judge. Mercifully, just as the first parable promises the vindication of the righteous, the second parable promises the vindication of a sinner more like the rest of us. Both stories show God's love and grace to those who trust in God enough to go to God in prayer. Saints and sinners, men and women, you and me. The details about the widow in the story are interesting, even amusing when you read the original Greek. But even without parsing the details, the parable provides a classic argument style. If the unjust judge would help a poor widow for whatever reason, so much more would the Lord our God, who is loving and good, grant justice to God's people who pray to God for redeeming night and day, praying without ceasing and never losing heart. It is a turbulent time in our nation, a time of political uncertainty and fearful waiting, a time of uncertainty in our congregation as well, a time when some of our congregants have been ill, one gravely so, and another one of our members, a stalwart pillar of the church, has just recently passed away. It is time to be reminded of Christ's message that we must pray always and not lose heart. But there's more. The paradox of prayer is what we must discover this morning so that we can remember and refocus and reconfigure our understanding of what the Lord has asked of us. To pray always for sure, but how do we pray? And what are we praying for? What justice? What outcome from God can we hope to receive back in return? Does prayer work? One answer might be, sometimes. Does prayer get you what you want? What you prayed for? Sometimes. There are miracle stories of healing through prayer, inexplicable outcomes that are credited to prayer. But just as often there are prayers unanswered, just as often there are prayers for one action to unfold when another action is taken, and sometimes for the better. Sometimes the ultimate sought-after outcome is achieved in unforeseen ways. I've already told you the story of the Chinese farmer whose fortunes rose and fell, good luck, bad luck, who's to say, until all is revealed for better or worse, God's plan in the end. Does prayer work? The answer requires us to rethink our prayer requests, to consider that perhaps it is not God, but rather we who must make concessions. Perhaps the answer is not testing to see if God gives us what we want, but rather 
the answer is for us to modify what we are asking for. And sometimes, in the hardest situations, what we really should be praying for is God's mercy. One woman began praying this way, let my friend die at home, Lord, and not in the hospital. Let him go quickly and without pain with his loved ones present. That is my prayer. If God is truly at the center of our lives, then we must orient ourselves around Christ at our center. The prayer paradox then requires something of a Copernican revolution, for the sun does not revolve around us, but rather we revolve around God's sun. We must learn to pray all over again, because prayer is not asking for what we want, so much as seeking God's help to be changed in ways we cannot imagine, to be more grateful, to see more good in what we have been given, rather than grieving for what might have been. Our prayers will be answered, but almost never in the way we expect. The paradox of prayer is that prayer is not about changing divine will or altering the vector of God's plans towards our own needs and wants, not even the most selfless of our wishes. Instead, to pray is to enter gently into relationship with God. And when we do that, and when we are persistent with our prayers and never lose heart, we find that it is our own minds that are changed, our own hearts that are softened, our own fears that are assuaged. Then slowly, but surely, over a lifetime of prayer, the hopes and desires we form in our souls begin to curve gently heavenward towards the will and wishes of our Creator God. Thank <laughs> you.